Welcome to AP European History with Dr. Borovkin. We continue uh, our series of uh, lectures on French Enlightenment, the Age of Reason, and uh, a wonderful group of uh, scholars known as the Philosophes. And today we'll talk about one of the most important ones, Voltaire. Voltaire is very hard to talk about because usually there's one or two books that people have written and these become the contribution. In case of uh, Rousseau or Helveticus or uh, Olbach, it's one or two books. Voltaire wrote dozens and dozens of books. He had a huge, long life of 90, close to 90 years. It's extremely difficult to focus on one or two or three or, or several. So there's several uh, categories that we could talk about Voltaire in terms of his contribution to enlightenment. And, uh, and then kind of stages of his life that would identify him as being most important during this stage. So he was born in 1694, so, uh, and he died in 1778, which is 10 years before the revolution. He basically was a contemporary to all the people that we've discussed, and he was friends with most of them, and he knew most of them, including the English ones, because he did stay in England. So he knew Frederick the Great, and and he knew uh, Hume and, and uh, Adam Smith, and uh, uh, and of course the, all the French ones, or Olbach and Velvetius and Rousseau and and uh, uh, D'Alembert and and everybody else. Uh, so I think uh, Voltaire becomes first known uh, in, in his uh, youth uh, when he starts writing critical and satirical essays. So his first contribution really was he was a satirist. And, and that sense of humor, this kind of poking fun at things, is probably what distinguishes Voltaire in all his writings. And he immediately got into trouble, uh, and he had to leave. And, and so he goes to England uh, in, his early, uh, er, in his youth. And that becomes a very important experience because here he sees something that he does like. Uh, and his first book, here his book is on, on England, uh, where he does praise something that he would remain loyal to for the rest of his life, which is the idea of enlightened uh, monarchy or enlightened constitutional monarchy. So he basically sees things that he praises highly. You know, the rule of law, the division of power, the, the aristocrats that that are wise and educated and, and that are investing in the future of their country. He praises England actually a, a little bit too much. But in any case, uh, that kind of becomes for him an example of uh, what uh, enlightened monarchy should be like. Um, then he comes back and then it, it kind of goes on and off, on and off. And as soon as something gets published, he gets into trouble, he has to go. And so his foreign uh, escapades are with, uh, connected with three places. The first was England. Uh, most of the time, it would be Switzerland. And one of the most important times, it would be his stay with Frederick the Great in Germany. Uh, but mostly, it's Switzerland. So it's interesting, he goes to Geneva. This is where he has uh, his home. He built uh, himself a home. And the, a very interesting episode about Geneva uh, is that uh, the Calvinists, of course, who rule Geneva, don't like entertainment and don't like the theater. But, of course, Voltaire loves theater. He wrote dozens of plays. And so this is what the funny moment is. Uh, Geneva is very close to the French border. So he built a theater in France, right on the border, so that all his friends and Genevans could go to his theater uh, right to France uh, while living in Geneva. Uh, so this is one of those uh, things that he did. Uh, and, and then the, the next one, of course, is Berlin. Uh, and this is also extremely important relationship that he had with Frederick the Great. Uh, Frederick wrote to him as a young man, uh, sending him very, very flowery letters in, in French, uh, how much he's an admirer of his satire and of his book on, on England. What attracted Frederick to... Uh, Voltaire was this idea of enlightened monarchy. As we shall see, Frederick himself was one, and with his fa famous words, I am the servant of the people, he was very interested in Voltaire, and Voltaire wrote commentary to, uh, to uh, Frederick the Great's first book that he himself, Frederick, wrote. 
which was called Anti-Machiavel. In fact, it was Voltaire who published it, who encouraged young Frederick the Great to publish this book. And it was published with the introduction of uh, Voltaire in Amsterdam. So this is the beginning of this relationship that's lasted for years and years and years. And I believe it was in 1750s that uh, Voltaire comes to Berlin and uh, he lives in Saint Souci, uh, this beautiful palace that uh, Frederick the Great built in Potsdam outside of Berlin. And I've been there in these rooms and they have reconstructed the table uh, and they have this kind of a, uh, set up uh, that this is where Voltaire said this is where Frederick the Great then there was an Italian opera singer and then there were other invited guests and so he had apartments of his own and every evening they would have these long long dinners uh, and discussions uh, of philosophy and things so it was a wonderful experience uh, that Voltaire said several years he stayed in Berlin um, so um, now let me just talk a little bit about Voltaire as a satirist, because that's what he's really known for. Uh, and his uh, most important book as a satirist is called Candide. Um, so what is Candide? A, Candide is a simpleton. He's a kind of a simple guy who encounters all kinds of weird stuff. And, and fate takes him all over the world. I mean, it's absolutely uh, uh, incredible. It, uh, it is, uh, of course, Lisbon after the earthquake, which shook uh, very much the, uh, uh, the consciousness and, and, and very personality of Voltaire. That's a so separate topic, but what really shook him up is why would God, if there is a God, do such a horrible thing as a earthquake? Now, there's nothing wrong with earthquake except that it destroyed 135 churches with innocent nuns in them. And this is what Voltaire couldn't quite understand. If God is omnipowerful, if everything that happens is under the control of God, then why would he destroy 135 churches with nuns and people in them who were praying to him? That just was incomprehensible. Moreover, uh, the, the people were saying at the time, this is punishment for the sins of the Christians and for the Christian church. And Voltaire found out that that same earthquake, by the way, that same earthquake de destroyed an old, old mosque in Rabat, in Morocco. Same earthquake. It was the same shift. Uh, then how could it be a punishment to the Christians for their sins if the Muslims were punished as well? Uh, so this is... Um, uh, this is what the beginning of the story of Candide is in Lisbon. And then he goes to El Dorado, which is somewhere in Latin America, uh, where he says a kind of a, like utopia of Thomas More, El Dorado is equality for all and everybody's equal. And he paints the kind of a picture of a perfect society, pretty much mimicking uh, Thomas More in the... Um, fraternity and labor, that people, he fantasizes about society where people are happy and they live in brotherhood and working together and sharing things. Uh, it is a kind of a criticism of fanaticism uh, that is institutionalized. And then, then fate takes him to Constantinople and again he kind of uses it to say that there are Christian churches and there are Muslims and they live side by side and there's no, nobody's killed, nobody's burned, nobody's executed for religious belief. So it, it's, he kind of uses this Candide as a kind of simple thing. He goes around and says, ah, ooh, isn't that like that? That's interesting. And, and, uh, and then there's a love story there with the... Uh, a girl who he's trying to save in Constantinople and she's sold into slavery and he rescues her. It, it's just a, a, a kind of a, a canopy of incredible adventures of this Candide. But with it, uh, you could see that it would be fascinating for the simple reader of the time, but it would have all kinds of political messages and political satires and poking fun at the idiocy uh, of a Christian uh, faith and Catholic Church. So this is the satire. That is extremely important part of it. everything that he would do later on would have a satirical, humorous bent to it. And that really distinguishes Voltaire from anybody else. 
But I would like it to focus now is the story that, that was uh, I was extremely impressed with, uh, a side of Voltaire that pretty much nobody knows, except those specialists who study his life uh, in, in great detail. That shows Voltaire as a, as a citizen, as a person, as a defender, as a public figure who put incredible effort uh, into defending an innocent man. So let me uh, focus on this story, which I think characterizes Voltaire in the best possible light. So this case is known as the case of Kalas. Uh, so Mr. Kalas was a Huguenot, and he was a merchant, I think in Toulouse, yes, in the south of France. And as Huguenots, one more time, you see, this is the thing. Uh, they had no civil rights. Their marriages were not considered valid. They, their inheritance was non-existent. Uh, if a priest would officiate at any of the wedding or anything of the Huguenots, that priest was subject to arrest and execution. So it was a very, very serious discrimination. They wouldn't kill him for just being a Huguenot, but he wouldn't have any opportunities in life uh, and wouldn't be able to do anything. So what the problem with this particular family was that uh, Mr. Kalas had a son, uh, and this son uh, was hiding the fact that he was a Huguenot, and he was studying to become a lawyer. Uh, and then it was, uh, uh, and then it was discovered that, that he was a Huguenot, uh, and he, he couldn't become a lawyer. He, he would not be able to, to exercise any profession in uh, France of the Ancien Regime. So the poor man uh, was so desperate that he hanged himself. He committed suicide. Uh, but by the rules of the, of the time, anybody who commits a suicide wouldn't have a, uh, a normal um, burial because that's sinful. Uh, activity, and he would have to be uh, dragged through the streets as a sinner that would go to hell and all that. And his father, in order to prevent this humiliation of his son, they at first hid the fact that he committed suicide. They said he died. Uh, and then uh, there was a rumor spread that he didn't die, that, that he was killed. Uh, and the reason that these inflamed fanatics were saying he was killed was because he wanted to uh, convert to uh, Catholicism. So there was a commission and an investigation, uh, and, and this shows you the justice of France at that time, which is, of course, Middle Ages compared to England. This is what they did. They subjected Mr. Callas to torture, and they were torturing him so that he would confess that he killed his son, and he didn't confess. And then what they did, they, they hanged him upside down, and they started pulling his, his legs apart. Uh, this is civilized, civilized France doing it in the 1760s. Until uh, his legs just basically were torn out of their sockets. Uh, and then they lay him down and they started banging on, on his bones until they broke them, uh, broke them to, to, to nothing. And he still wouldn't confess. He still was saying he was dying. He was saying, no, I didn't kill my son. Um, so finally he died, and, uh, and still was uh, everybody, the verdict was that he was a murderer uh, of his own son, and, and this is what Huguenots do to their children because he wanted to ostensibly convert to Catholicism. So uh, when Voltaire heard of the story, he was absolutely shocked and terrified, and the widow of Mr. Callas, she wrote a letter to him explaining everything that happened. And, and this is where I'm so uh, happy to report to you. Voltaire spent the next seven years of his life fighting for Kalas. And not only for Kalas, but all these other cases uh, of discrimination and torture and, and the, uh, unfairness uh, that um, uh, are in similar cases. Uh, so how he, did he do it? He, um, first of all, he wrote, to, um, he wrote pamphlets. He wrote uh, an appeal to the monarchs of Europe. He wrote to Frederick the Great, to Catherine, uh, to Gustavus in Sweden. Uh, he uh, asked them to, uh, uh, to write protest letters to the French king. Uh, he asked him to raise money, which they did. They sent him money. He hired new lawyers. He, he, he wanted this case to be reopened and reconsidered. And, and he won. In the end, he did win. The case was reconsidered. The, uh, it took seven years, but finally Mr. Callas was found innocent. 
Moreover, not only that, but the culmination of his efforts uh, was that in 1787, uh, uh, which is almost 20 years after 87, uh, he after, 20 years after the case of Kalas, Turgo, who was at that time a prime minister, uh, just on the eve of the revolution, uh, finally passed a, a law on toleration. Uh, so, so toleration was restored a hundred years after it was abolished by uh, Louis XIV. But it, but it was thanks to these heroic efforts of Voltaire. New, uh, on this we will note about one of the greatest men of enlightenment. And don't forget to put your likes and to tell your friends and subscribe and hear a lot more exciting stories about uh, European history with Dr. Brofkin.